Welcome to the Manage Self Lead Others podcast. I'm your host, Nina Sunday. And in this episode, we're turning the mic around and my assistant, Kobe Tarvet, will ask me questions about leading people and the eight good behaviors of a manager. Thanks for joining me, Kobe. What's your first question? Thanks for having me, Nina. Great to be here. And in your book, Workplace Wisdom for Nine to Thrive, you've written about the eight good behaviors of a manager. I'm wondering what's the number one mistake managers make? The number one mistake managers make is not understanding their real job. And the reason I know it's the number one mistake is because it was the number one mistake I made in the early days of being a manager until I decided to make studying how to be a good manager my focus. I thought it was all about focusing on results that the team uh, achieving uh, our sales results. I thought it was all about uh, operational excellence. But what I realised is that it's about culture and it's about building capability and that if you're not building capability on a daily basis through continuous improvement, through regular team huddles and short meetings, unless you're doing that, then you're not going to have motivated team members and you're not going to have the operational excellence because there's something about focusing on culture where the excellence automatically follows. So the real job of a manager, of a leader, is to lead people and to build their capability. Tell us how the Google company researched and discovered a list of eight good behaviours of a manager. This is absolutely fascinating research that was written up by the Harvard Business Review as a case study. It was about 2012 when Google asked the question, do managers matter? And so what they needed to do in order to answer that question is do some research based on what sort of behaviours or attributes of managers uh, contributes to team effectiveness. So they, they looked at sort of superficial things, I suppose, like the educational level of of different managers compared to team output. They looked at um, manager style. Some managers were uh, more authoritarian or more directive, while other managers were more laissez-faire or more more, um, uh, free flow. Uh, They looked at uh, the sort of um, conversational style in meetings. Um, Did the manager, was the manager quite directive in a meeting or did the manager encourage uh, free flow of ideas? So they kind of um, whittled it down uh, to also a number of attributes that they then compiled two assessments. One was a self-assessment based on behaviour and another was an upwards feedback survey based on how their direct reports, how the individual contributors who uh, uh, reported to that manager, how they viewed the manager. So so their analytical team sort of matched those those questions, those answers coming from two different areas. And they then then compiled a list of behaviours in order of priority. And it's interesting because when you look at behaviour number one to behaviour number four to behaviour number eight, It's all in order of priority. What's most important that contributes to team effectiveness and achieving of results? That's very interesting. Thanks. So that manager self-assessment you just talked about, Nina, it lists questions such as, do you share relevant information from senior leadership? And why do you think sharing information is so important? Could you please tell us a little bit more about that? Brainpower training over the years has a, a running survey where we, because one of our areas of uh, expertise is doing training on the five cohesive behaviours uh, 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 of a team and how to uh, how to avoid the five dysfunctional behaviours of, uh, of team members, um, we've been looking at toxic behaviours and getting feedback from our uh, from our subscriber base on here are say twenty behaviours. Which ones would you rank in order of of annoyance? Which ones annoy you the most? And consistently at the top, and we've sort of had about a 1,000 responses and it's growing, consistently at the top is the withholding of information. So 
I've been discussing this with my different groups as we do uh, presentations and training. And it would appear that when managers withhold information about what's happening, about plans, about like at the moment because um, it's all about are we returning completely to the office or are we going to have flexible work arrangements, uh, working a little bit from home, a little bit from office, all those sort of things. There have even been manager surveys that the EY company did last year, the accounting firm, where about 38% of companies aren't communicating with their individual contributors and team leaders and team members what their plans are. So guess what happens? Rumours start. People start, it, it, it becomes like Chinese whispers. People sort of go, well, I wonder if this is going to happen. And then suddenly the next person says, this is what's going to happen. So it really uh, cr- can create disruption, uh, un- uh, un- a feeling of being un- feeling of being unsettled. It, it just doesn't contribute to a transparency or an open workplace where pe- people can trust what the senior leaders are doing. So that seems to me that the withholding of, of information by senior leaders seems to be the one toxic behaviour over and above bullying, probably because... Bullying is less common than the withholding of information. So it becomes top of mind. People just go, I wish they would just fill me in and keep me updated, keep me in the loop. Another self-assessment question is, perhaps it's a little surprising to you, have you had a discussion about your career development in the last six months? Yes. Well, when we bring this one up with, uh, with audiences, a lot of people say, oh, I never thought to have a discussion with my, with my uh, uh, supporters, my individual contributors about their careers. I mean, isn't that their responsibility? And I say, well, you have people in your orbit for a certain period of time. It might be six years. It might be two years. It could be 15 or 20 years. But the whole thing is, it is incumbent on an organisation to make sure that you grow and build the capability of your team members so that if and when they do decide to apply for another role, whether it be within your company, if it's large enough to do that, or outside, you've grown them to the point where they can go to the next interview and say, in answer to the question, and how did your organisation build your capability they can actually list, well, I was uh, given uh, responsibilities that, and I was promoted to a, a new roles and they rotated me amongst different roles. Or It's all about making sure that people feel that they're growing, that they're making professional progress and personal progress. Uh, so that's why having a conversation about what what would what are your plans? I'll give you some examples. I used to work in television before I started this training company, and we're talking a couple of decades ago. I might still be working in television if my supervisor had had exactly that conversation with me, because you see, I came to that television station as a three a graduate of the three-year Australian Film, TV and Radio School program, I'd studied directing, I'd studied production management, I'd studied all aspects of filmmaking, and I was ambitious and I saw this as a stepping stone to becoming a director, whether it be television, perhaps not film, but certainly in television. I saw it as being a stepping stone to quite a nice creative role, possibly executive producer. They never knew that. They never asked me. They never knew that. They didn't know I was ambitious. All they were doing was paying me to to do the job that I was hired for. And it seems to me that if you you treat people like they're just being paid to do the job they were hired for, their motivation is going to go downhill and you will have a disgruntled, disengaged team member who is not giving what we call uh, discretionary effort. They'll do the bare minimum because you're only asking them to do what you paid them to do. And anything above that, you didn't pay them to do. So you didn't 
praise them, you didn't acknowledge them, you didn't encourage them to grow, you didn't give them a picture of a bright future. I remember looking back going, I can't see that I have an opportunity to move out of this role that was very much budgets and and, uh, cash flow forecasts. And every time they said, Nina, we want you to do a cash flow forecast, my stomach would do a turn. I went, that's not what I came here for. (laughs) Even though I could do it, I didn't want to do it. And on that note, another aspect of that, I've had over the years, I've had uh, as many as 10 people as my direct reports. And I frequently, every year, I would uh, hire somebody that was in a gap year straight after school because I found that, one, they were planning to go to university, they were still fresh from high school, and they were very eager to learn, and they were pretty open to most of the uh, tasks that we asked them to do. But a few months into this uh, uh, young woman that was... um, was planning to be there for the entire year before she went on to social work at uni, and she did. Um, I, as a morning meeting, I just sort of wrote up on the flip chart, let's do a little summary of most of your tasks and let's let's work out which ones do you love to do, which are okay, and are there any that irk you, that you go, oh, I wish I didn't have to do that one. Could it, could Could I hand that off to someone else? And it was an interesting process because there were a couple of tasks that she didn't really like at all. She was happy to do them because it was part of her job. But I went, well, that's very interesting. We have other people here on the team. I can find out if we can maybe do a bit of a task swap and maybe hand hand off those, uh, those tasks because someone has to do it, but maybe it doesn't have to be you. And I think if we can have that conversation even one-on-one because I, I suppose you don't no one really wants to have that conversation in front of others it's a it's a it's a private conversation so I feel that doing that is a very positive mood big move because you do want to keep people motivated and you don't want them to become demotivated that was very interesting thank you Nina So what's another toxic behaviour of a manager that might lead to other unintended consequences? Oh, you know what people tell me? That whenever something goes wrong or there's a mistake or an error, the first thing the manager does and look for who's to blame. So blame culture. That is the biggest no-no. And the thing is I have to hear this from other people because it wasn't in my DNA to look for mistakes because I was, I feel very happy that in the very early days of my business, before I even had any staff at all, I read um, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, the, the, the original small version, short version. And one of the things that he said was it's important to have procedures and it's important to identify that if someone has made an error, is it the process that's at fault? Is it because there is no check or balance? Is it because in the um, you've relied on someone to just be good or to remember what to do instead of have, having standard operating procedures? And a few years into my business, I, when we did have uh, some team members on, on board, I hired a temp for a little while, temporary um, uh, assistant, And she had come from a financial services background and as a a favour to me, she sort of said, Nina, I'm very good at writing procedures. Would you like me to do an operations manual for you? I went, would you? That would be great. And she got me on the straight and narrow because that particular, it was, we printed it off. These days it's all soft copy online but on our intranet. But um, she printed it off put it in nice plastic uh, document covers and put it in a folder. But it was everything that we did was step-by-step described. And what I find is that even if I know a task or the steps involved, if I don't have to think about it, it's less cognitive load, as we say in the neuroscience community. It's like you might know what to do, but because you have to remember what to do, 
it causes more um, strain, I suppose, than is necessary. So I find that, like for me, confirming an event, we do that all day, every day. But if I have a checklist of procedures or a spreadsheet with uh, a series of columns saying this is the next step, this is the next step, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to check whether something has been sent or not sent or received or not received. And this whole thing about procedures. So the Gerber principle is if a mistake has been happened, as has happened, where is the process at fault? And don't look for someone else, for a human to be at fault. I mean, occasionally it will be human error, but that's not your um, modus operandi. Your, what you want is a culture where people are willing to fess up to their mistakes with a view to let's learn from that. We made this mistake, this error. What's the problem with the procedure that the process didn't tell us before the error occurred that something was going to go astray or go awry. So it's all about having procedures with checks and balances so it's not reliant on people's memory or uh, people just being good at their role because there's a risk in that. I see this quite often when I'm working with businesses. I might be doing a presentation, but they'll talk about their process on the way through. And I'll go, you've got all this reliance on this one person it seems like there are no step-by-step instructions written down. If that person left or got ill and just couldn't work, you might be up the creek a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's blame culture, getting away from that and finding ways to make sure that we're less dependent on people being terrific at what they do and having great memories and being able to follow a process that is repeatable and transferable. So how should a manager approach coaching poor performance? Well, number one, fast feedback. As soon as you see a behaviour that you would like, or that is not what you want, that you want to uh, fix, I suppose, as soon as you see a behaviour that you want to um, transform, arrange for a, a short one-on-one conversation and talk about it. and and I'm going to suggest a a, a template that you can use, but by not saying anything is is the same as condoning that behaviour because they know that you know what they've been doing. And if you don't say anything, part of them will go, oh, it must be okay then. Especially new new hires, they they might come from a place where certain behaviours are natural and normal but it's not the way you do things. So you definitely want to um, get them used to your idiosyncrasies early, get them used to the culture early, and in a nice way, as I say, avoiding blame culture, uh, sit them down and sort of explain to them that's not how we do things around here. Now, when I have this conversation about handling difficult conversations with my audiences, uh, people will say to me, well, it's because I don't know exactly what to say. And, you know, I can relate to that because I was very slow. I made the same mistake. I was very slow to say what I think, thought, because I went, oh, it's not that bad. Or it seems like a little thing. If I might come across as petty. But do you know what? That little petty thing that I didn't say and I was the boss and I was the business owner, I found a way to restructure that job so she no longer had to work for me. And I'm going, I look back now and I go, well, I took an artificial response to what could have been fixed right from the start if I'd have just said what irked me and explained what I would like to see them do in future. So we've got this five-step template and it, um, it has four letters and then a, a behavior at the a question at the end. So B F I R. And it's in my book, Workplace Wisdom for Nine to Thrive. It's a five step verbal uh, feedback template. And the B is for behavior, the F is for feeling, the I is for impact, the R is for results. And then you ask the question, uh, how do you feel about that? Or would you be willing to um, try something different next time? Whatever. 
So the, it will take a very simple behaviour, like you have um, you have meetings, but you notice one person is is constantly arriving after the meeting has started. So we'll call that late for for a meeting. So, Jill, when you arrive late for a meeting, or when you arrived late for a meeting yesterday, if I felt frustrated because we we all had to I for impact, we all had to stop our conversation mid-sentence and give you a summary of what we'd just spoken about. And it seems to me that it wastes everybody's time. And what I'd like to see in future are result. What I'd like to see in future is would you be willing to make sure you turn up ahead of the start time so that you, like others in the room, arrive, say, five minutes early and then we can all start together sharp on time and we don't waste anybody's time by having to repeat what we've just said. How do you feel about that? So there's the five-step template. Now, of course, you don't do it right every time. There are other templates. Uh, the McKinsey template is, is a, a three-step template, but I've added a few extra steps. It's important that you have a template so you know exactly what to say, so you can give fast feedback um, the day or the day after this behaviour happens that irks you. And I think you'll find that you'll get more respect and get more of the behaviour that you want. So you've mentioned a few times about the importance of one-on-one -on -one meetings. What sort of things can a manager talk about during one of these one-on-one -on -one meetings? So the idea of a one-on-one -on -one is to have about a 15-minute conversation one-on-one -on -one about once a month at the very least, about once every two weeks, uh, as an ideal. And it's really uh, just maybe asking some open questions such as, how are you feeling? Are there, um, what's on your mind? Are there any obstacles? Do you, is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything in your way that you'd like me to help um, clear your path? So it's you coming across as a trusted advisor where you're asking questions, where you invite them to express how they're feeling, what's top of mind, are there any obstacles or constraints, and how can you help? If you just take that approach, that's what's going to cultivate not only a good relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, but also good team effectiveness because now people are starting to see that there's a channel of communication where they will be heard. That was a very good answer, Nina. Thank you for that. So just on the topic of delegating tasks, how can a manager delegate a task to someone so they feel supported rather than micromanaged? I've delivered training in organisations where it was quite obvious through just what uh, different team members said that either the head honcho was a bully, they wield disapproval like a sword is a comment I heard once. I wouldn't want to be working for that particular director. The other observation I've had is where people were sort of um, instructed on every step of the way as if they were children. So it creates an adult to child relationship. If you think about transactional analysis, they talk about is it adult to adult or is it parent to child? So you actually want to have an adult-to-adult -adult relationship with your team members, not parent-to-child. Now, micromanaging is turning you into the authoritarian parent and them into the obedient child. That is not a healthy relationship for the workplace. Um, not only that, it doesn't allow for continuous improvement because, you see, there's a, there's a, um, a saying in uh, coding called, it's, uh, it's sort of an acronym, Tim Toady, there is more than one way to do it. There is more than one way to do it. And the great thing about not micromanaging is if you tell them the result that you want, it allows that person to find their own way to, uh, to, to, to get to that result. And sometimes that's where innovations start. I know uh, because we teach speed reading and one of the things we like to do is uh, add, our, add our stats, our results, 
to our statistic, st historical statistics over the years. And I've had different assistants. And one year, um, this one went on to become a doctor. I, I like to have in, uh, university students as assistants. They, they really uh, have great input. This one went on to become a doctor and he did a spreadsheet that I couldn't even follow, but I could tell it was, was correct. The guy was super smart. And um, so he found his way of doing it, which was doing this spreadsheet. And then the next year I had a social work student and she was more from the humanities and she just did a tally system, you know, a manual one, you know, tick, 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 different results. And both methods came up with the correct answer. And not that the either way was, was, was better than the other. It was all about getting to a result. Having said that, if you do allow people to find their own ways to get to an outcome, you may find that they do, in fact, find in, uh, improved ways of doing things. So you want to be able to cultivate continuous improvement, 1% improvements, allow people uh, the opportunity to do it the way they, they think it should be done. But here's the thing. Whenever you've delegated something, take 30 seconds to invite them to tell back to you, now, how do you think you might approach this? Because you do want to check that they're not going to go off on the wrong tangent that's going to take days of effort when actually it's just a two-hour job. So uh, it's about if you know you are a micromanager, just, you know, withhold that, that urge to tell them how to do it because you know how to do it and just allow them the opportunity to discover and flourish because that, that's how people flourish is they find their own way, uh, ways and means of achieving the, the goal of the, of the task or the project. So you've written about how team members needing to have an understanding of their purpose in the work, workplace. How important is it to clearly set out big picture organisational goals? Well, you want people to understand how they fit in in the big scheme of things. And an important area of that is to, to be proud of where they work. And one way to be proud of where they work is to remind them of the big picture benefit they're giving the community. So, for example, I was, um, I was on my way driving to a ski resort where it was pre-season. We were doing customer service training uh, to a couple of hundred people. And so I'm musing as I'm driving, thinking, well, okay, the big picture benefit. This is a ski resort snowboarding, skiing, uh, and I was going to be giving training to paramedics, uh, people uh, in hospitality, people looking after the, the, the hotel and the lodging, uh, people looking after the uh, sports store, uh, the lifties, as we call them, the people that help people often on the lifts, the, the ski instructors, everybody. And, of course, they had one weekend where it was all new people and another weekend where it was returning uh, staff for, who'd worked there previous years. So they wanted somebody to give them a fresh viewpoint and about customer service and the importance of it, of course, because it's a tourism uh, location. So I was thinking, well, what's the biggest big picture benefit that a ski resort is giving the country of Australia or, or any country really? Uh, that has a ski resort. And I went, well, we do compete in the Winter Olympics. And what if I said to them, just remember that whatever role you have, you are part of an entire community that's helping Australia win gold in the Winter Olympics. And I paused at that moment and looked around the room. It was an auditorium of 250 people and I could see them sort of shift in their chair as they took that concept in and I really got the sense that they felt more proud of their, of their role and where their little cog in the wheel fitted to the big machine. And I went, well, that's a winning, a winning concept, a big-picture concept. So um, I think if you... Whatever industry you're in, whether it be healthcare or manufacturing, just see that 
that particular niche industry is part of the bigger uh, industry that that keeps our keeps our world moving, that keeps us being healthy and with well being. So it's it's up to the manager to sort of every now and again remind people of that big picture benefit. And of course, one way to do it is to tell stories from your experience of being in the company of where these benefits have uh, played out. And, in fact, if you go back to one of our earlier um, episodes with Gabrielle Dolan on magnetic stories, I think you'll get some really great ideas on how you can use uh, corporate stories to make your team members feel proud and feel like they're part of a uh, part of a bigger entity than just the team that they're in and the job they're doing. So expressing interest in team members' success and well-being, how can a manager get to know a little bit about their, the private life of their team members without invading their privacy? One of the good behaviours of a manager is to express interest and concern as appropriate in the private life of their team members. And it's all about setting up situations where it makes it possible. And I'll tell you a story from when I made a shift in my own business. It was a couple of decades ago, and I read this book. It was it was published in the 90s. It was called The Happiness-Centred Business by a Brisbane dentist by the name of Dr. Paddy Lund. And I really recommend that book, and I think it's still available on the, on, on the web. And the one thing that I picked out of that was the concept of team members sharing morning tea together. And that's what we call it in Australia. In another country, you might call it morning coffee or morning water <laughs> or, or around the, the, the water cooler. So it occurred to me that the modus operandi of our office was that people would just get up, go over to the uh, kettle, boil their water, make their tea or coffee and take it back to their desk. The modus operandi was people would just go out, get some fresh air and eat their lunch on their own. There was no having lunch together. There was no having morning tea together. It was all done separately. And that particular book made me question. I went, I can actually remember when I worked as a teenager at my mother's office and they used to, this is the good old days, they used to actually have morning tea together. And I went, and they're talking about it in this book. I went, what if I tried that? And I'm here to say that is the single most useful activity for 15 minutes every morning around 11 o'clock. We would just, we'd all sort of agree that this was the right time. We'd aim for 11, but it might be 11, 10, 5 to 11. So whatever was the right time to have that morning tea, we would actually stop and sit down around a, a table together and just chat five or ten minutes. And that's when we'd find out someone's planning a cruise for their holiday. Someone else is planning for their uh, a family member's wedding. Someone else has uh, children uh, with, you know, uh, you know, running marathons in sport and, and trying to get into certain teams. We found out about each other's lives and we had never really taken the time to find that out before because occasionally people would have, you know, little conversations on the side, but we never made it a ritual or a regular thing. And I'm here to say that I never enjoyed my team more than we allowed that 15 minutes uh, most days. Of course, some days were just frantic and we just skipped it. But as a general rule, if it was a normal day, we would have this uh, morning tea together because I do know that we used to celebrate people's birthdays and, and any special uh, events that you have in Australia, any seasonal events, but that really wasn't enough. You know, you might, I mean, you might have six or eight people where you might go out to lunch once every two months to celebrate someone's birthday. That's not really enough to find out about, you know, about others. And a manager, yes, they can have an arm's length relationship, you, you, you're not their you're not their friend. You're not their mate, but you, it is nice to have that heartfelt culture where you do care and can emotionally support to some degree when people are going through little struggle moments. And we all have those off and on. 
And it's not that we become therapists or, 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 or social workers for them, but if people are going through a bit of a struggle time, we can give them some emotional support. If they're celebrating something special, we can also support them there. But the other thing I used to always do is when it was time for the <laughs> morning tea to finish, I would just go mini meeting and we'd just talk about something work-related for five minutes. So it meant that we were having a mini meeting every every second day. I wouldn't do it every time, but if there was something to talk about, I'd say mini meeting. So I really believe that um, uh, there's another <laughs> episode in the podcast on the hardest culture of the Accor group, which is a uh, international hotel group, and they've got this culture where they consciously take time to ask people to have chit-chat before a meeting actually starts. So this is especially in uh, in times when we're doing a lot of meetings through Zoom or through uh, online, to actually take time even in the online environment to find out about what's happening in people's lives. And one of your catchphrases is to change before you have to, start a second curve. Please tell us a little bit more about that. I have to say that Jack Welsh is the one that I read that that statement from, but I've really taken it to heart because I align that with Charles Handy's uh, S-curve, which is in any relationship or in the arc of life, in any cycle, and I'm thinking now of the cycle of employment where people come on board, uh, they uh, they come on board and they're sort of at a neutral position, but then as, as they progress uh, in the role, they're getting better and more. So they're new in the role. They become better at, at achieving in the role. And then what tends to happen, and this is, this is how I observed how I was treating my team members. This is in the early days of, of, of having staff. I observed that when they got good, I kind of left them to their own devices. It's like, well, they can do the job now, so I'll just leave them alone to do it. And while that's not micromanaging, it is actually laissez-faire leadership, which is ignoring them. It's not put giving them input. And so what has to happen, the S-curve is, yes, they, they start slow, but then they, they go up, but then they plateau, but then they get demotivated and the curve starts to go south. And Charles Handy would say, you change before you have to, you re-motivate before the, the slope of motivation has started to dip. You actually find ways to re-motivate people. So it could be giving them a fresh, uh, a fresh role or a fresh project. Could be if it's a larger organisation where you have capacity, um, rotate their role so that they're not st stuck in one role that they can learn to hate. So where you're building their capability. It's all about the real job of a manager is to build the capability of your people so that they either can get promoted within your organisation or if not, you've grown them to the point where when they do go for the next role outside of your organisation, you they have something on their CV that demonstrates that for the time that they were with their current employer, they grew as a team member and in their capability and in their knowledge, skills and behaviour. So the Google study that we were talking about earlier placed technical skills not as the top priority but as the eighth priority. I would have thought being the most proficient and skilled would be very important towards successfully managing a team. Why do you think they placed it as number eight on the list? Well, number one, most people share your surprise because most people think that a manager to lead a team has to be as good as or better than in in the in the skill that that they're uh, they're working in but in fact the thing about managers is if you can hire people who are better than you at some some or, or all of the tasks that you do it's your job to project manage them and to lead them and to inspire them it's not your job to be the best team member at particular skills and how did they come up with that? That's because they did their research and they, through the um, algorithm, they worked out the order of priority. And it just so happened that uh, depending on the questionnaires that they asked and the results that they compiled, 
that from a team member's perspective, what they judged as being what they valued, that being good at particular technical skills was less important than, to them than the soft skills of creating relationship, cultivating uh, career goals, um, facilitating uh, information sharing and uh, removing obstacles and policies or, or, you know, red tape that prevented people from getting their work done. They saw that those soft skills as more important than actually being a technical advisor because anybody can give good, te good technical advice, but only their manager can be managing the, the, the emotional intelligence of the team. So Google discovered an additional two good behaviours of a manager. Would you be able to tell us about those two? Yes. So there's actually now the 10 good behaviours of a manager, not just the eight. And um, uh, the, 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 extra, the, the one that they've mentioned is to collaborate across teams, and it's all about good collaboration because I'll tell you something. Whether we, I go in to do productivity training, uh, leadership training, customer service training, the silo effect always comes up. And the silo effect says that two teams uh, involved in two different areas will often see the other as separate from themselves, so like in a different silo. And when there's that separation, there's either um, criticism uh, or lack of respect or not understanding their constraints and blame, all these things that come up because they're, they're separate entities and it kind of um, interferes with the whole sense of collaboration or the feeling as if they're one team, especially if the teams are in remote locations, not in the same location, but even a team on one floor and, and another team on the floor above that can still create the silo effect. So collaborating across teams is number one. And the second uh, or the, the second other behaviour of a, of a good manager is strong decision-making. And it's all about making decision-making a bit of a study to, to, to actually find a book. There's, there's a ton of them on, on Amazon or in bookstores on how to make good decisions, but find a way to, to learn a model for good decision-making. Uh, I'll give you an example. You may have heard of uh, Edward de Bono who, was the, who coined the phrase uh, lateral thinking and he also wrote The Six Thinking Hats. One of the books that I treasure by him is called The Dog Exercise Machine. And it describes some research that he did, and it includes pictures of dog exercise machines that were drawn by children in the study that he was doing. And what they did is they went, uh, they had a number of school children, <clears throat> and with one group, they didn't teach them methods of creativity or creative thinking or innovation. And with the other group, they did. They taught them how to think, how to get ideas, how to create fresh ideas. And so then they gave them, the two groups, a task. Now, draw a dog exercise machine. Now, of course, the obvious ones come up, a, uh, a treadmill with a dog on it with some food hanging like a carrot from, from, a, from a stick and a rope. But there were other very intricate, you know, other ones that were a bit like greyhounds um, chasing, <laughs> chasing a uh, a target around a, 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 a ring or an oval. But there were lots of different um, attributes to these uh, designs. And when they analysed them, they realised that the students that had been taught how to think had far more novel ideas and more creative ideas than the students that were just, oh, plucking it from air. So the reason I say that is if you learn a model or a process for making good decisions, relevant, just, wise decisions, your decisions will be better. Your decision-making will be, be better received and uh, fewer mistakes, uh, fewer backtracks will have to be made. So leadership is a, is a layered skill. It's not something you learn in two days and then you've learned it. 
it's it's a lifelong journey. So I encourage you to get a book on decision making, get a book on how to coach, get a book on being a good leader and uh, grow, build your own capability. That's called self-leadership. Thank you, Kobe. It's been great having you ask me these questions. Thanks for having me, Nina. I've received some amazing answers. Kobe, it's been a real pleasure and thanks for asking such astute questions.